referrals, no waiting room, no copay. Direct from the NYU Langone Medical Center, this is Dr. Radio. Welcome back, everybody, to the ENT Show. I'm your host, Dr. Sean McMenemy, Professor of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery and Neurological Surgery here at NYU Langone Health. Joined on the phone with Dr. Katherine Palmer, who's President-Elect of the American Academy of Audiology, and she's also an Associate Professor at the University of Pittsburgh and Director of their Fine Audiology Program there. We're taking your phone calls on all things hearing loss, hearing aids, diagnosis, how do you get into the system, whatever it is, we'll handle it, 877-NYU-DOCS, 877-698-3627, email us, docs, D-O-C-S, at SiriusXM.com, tweet us at NYU-DOCS or at Dr. Sean M-C-M, E-N. <laughs> I always mess that Twitter thing up. <laughs> Dr. Palmer, thanks again for taking time out of your day and joining us. It's my pleasure. You know, I wanted to follow up on, on one thing your caller was talking about, and then he, when you and I were both responding with things that you can do, you know, I think things are changing so quickly in terms of treatments and technology, um, FDA approvals of things and all those, that, that it really behooves people to have a relationship with their audiologist. And, you know, once they have identified hearing loss, they really want to be checking in, you know, once a year, once every two years, depending on the person, because there are such big changes, and they, they want, you know, an expert to help them kind of sort out, you know, what's, what's just marketing, what's real, you know, what applies to them. And I think that relationship can really help. Boy, that's very true. Just I was saying at the beginning of the show, I was at the American Academy of Otolaryngology last week in New Orleans, and all sorts of cutting-edge, breaking technologies in uh, in ear health were talked about and given as presentations, and there are a number of people across the country working on the, the holy grail, really, which is how do we make those tiny little hair cells work again once they quit working? And there's a lot of work going on with that, so exactly to your point, uh, stay involved, stay in touch, because things are changing rapidly, including changes in hearing aid technology. And I want to talk about that, but first I want to just have you bring up the uh, EARS method of protecting your ears, because I think it's kind of cool. It, yeah, it's cute, if nothing else. So, yeah, it spells ears, and it's to remind people, you know, if you're trying to protect your hearing, you really have four things you can do. You can wear earplugs. That's the um, E. That's the E. Yep, okay, e for I got earplugs. it. <laughs> yep. Um, and, I, and I would say that's just that's another place where um, checking in with your audiologist makes good sense um, because there are really a lot of different choices, and depending on what you do and how much protection you need and what you're still trying to hear, they can um, create customized solutions or tell you, hey, you don't even need something customized, but they can give you good, good advice about that, including musicians who are um, using in-ear monitors and things like that. So we got E for earplugs. A, for avoid loud sounds. So if that's something you can do, uh, by all means do it, but certainly like our musicians can't, and if you're the person with the leaf blower or the lawnmower, you, you can't actually avoid them. But if you can, certainly A, for avoid. R is reduce the level of sounds. And I always like to say this, you know, here I am, you know, a middle-aged person going into these high schools, and I always think that kids are looking at me thinking, oh, you know, what does she know? She doesn't, you know, probably even like decent music. Um, but you know, they should enjoy their music. And so if they want to turn it up um, when there's something they love, they should, and then they should remember to turn it back down. So it's being kind of in charge of your own world. Um, so at least part of the time you need to be reducing, that's R for reduce, and S for shorten the time. And so that's just to be thoughtful, again, about, you know, making choices. If I'm going to really want to enjoy something loud at this time, that's important to me. That's, you know, something about the music I need to be loud. On the other hand, when you're mowing the lawn and doing the leaf blowing and doing other things, then protect your hearing. So to reduce your dose. Right. And it's probably, if you're doing something like uh, working with a, a lathe or a lawnmower or, or a leaf blower, it's, it's even better to do double protection where you have the foam plug in the ear and then you wear a yeah. fluid-filled muff over the top of that. Yeah. I mean, it's just simply not worth the permanent um, problem. And, and what people don't understand uh, about hearing loss, and this is one of the frustrations people will have um, when they get hearing aids and they go to an audiologist and extremely well, you know, fit hearing aids, they're customized, they're measured, they're doing what they should do, and the, the patient has done what they should do, which is wear them full time for the brain to really adapt to all that new sound you need to wear a hearing aid all your waking hours and, and let that plasticity kick in. And even then, your hearing isn't back to normal, and, and people don't understand that. And I think it's because when we put glasses on, we're like, oh, now we can see. And that vision loss is a different kind of loss than what we're dealing with, the permanent hearing loss, which is a sensory loss, which means the sensory system has actually been damaged. So 
So as good a job as we do putting the sound into the ear canal, that sound is still going through a damaged system. And part of that damage makes it so things aren't as distinct as they once were. And even though advertising with hearing aids sometimes implies that we can fix that, we really can't. So I don't want to minimize hearing aids because they're tremendously helpful because if you can't hear the sound, you can't use it. But it isn't perfect. Um, And so wherever we can protect hearing and not have the damage in the first place, we want to do that. Absolutely. Well, we've got a bunch of callers on there, and let's try and get to them all. Let's say hello to Hal from West Virginia. Hal, welcome to Dr. Radio. Yeah, hi. Thanks for taking my call. You bet. I'm a 60-year-old, 62-year-old down in good health. I'm only going to take a little lipid throw before I go to bed in good shape. No, no matter. I developed a little tinnitus last year. So I went to my ENT and had an audiogram. Minor hearing loss. Really no treatment. Just wait and see how it goes. The tinnitus this year got progressively worse. I got a wind tunnel in my right ear. It's unilateral. Um, she did a couple, uh, another audiogram, and it got really worse. My hearing in my right ear where I have the tinnitus. It's only unilateral. Um, I've been on two doses of steroids, one progressively higher, the second dose, second dosing, and it's probably made it worse. So right now, you know, I'm worried about an acoustic neuroma. So I, what I, I have a couple questions. Anything I can do to get this wind tunnel? You know, I have to distract it with, you know, headphones or something to, to, to do something in there. An amp- I bought an amplifier, but it just made everything progressively really loud, and I couldn't, in a crowd, you really can't uh, listen to conversation with that. So. The last audiogram was reflected of Meniere's disease, but I don't have any of the symptoms of Meniere's disease, except the audiogram reflected that. I'm not lightheaded. I, you know, I'm two hours on the elliptical and all this, and I played a lot of sports. So um, I haven't had an MRI yet. Well, I have a couple questions. What can I do now? I know I need a hearing aid because my loss is, is progressively worse. And what's your experience with removing an acoustic neuroma or schwannoma? Because it's right near the facial nerve when you go in there. Um, and your experience with I don't know if you're a neurosurgeon or a neurosurgeon there. Yeah. If you've done okay, if, you know, your experience of taking them out and getting rid of the tinnitus, is it worth doing? Was it too risky? Well, I, I still can hear, but should I wait well, after if I have a elmo or Yeah, let's, let's, I, uh, let's do first things first, which is, number one, I would agree with you that for the audience, ear doctors basically don't like asymmetry. Audiologists and ear doctors don't like asymmetry. So we like the ears to match up. When they don't match up, like you're describing how one ear is worse than the other, you have tinnitus in one ear, not the other, then when we look at you in the office under the microscope, probably everything's going to look normal. Your eardrum's going to look normal. If your ear canal has a little wax, we can take that out. But probably everything's going to look normal because the asymmetry is a sensory neural hearing loss. It's from the inner ear or the hearing nerve, the eighth nerve. And the only way we can examine the hearing nerve or the cochlea is with an MRI. We can get a CAT scan if you're somebody that can't get an MRI, like you have an implantable pacemaker, but most people can get an MRI, and so that would be our preferable method of looking at the inner ear and that nerve. And some people with asymmetries, certainly not most, but some, will be diagnosed with an acoustic neuroma, which is how mentioned is something that he's concerned about. It's a benign tumor that can cause asymmetric hearing loss. It can cause problems with balance. It can cause problems with the facial nerve. And how to answer your question, not everybody with an acoustic neuroma needs it out. There are many, many people. I have probably hundreds, if not thousands, in my practice that were just watching and following with serial MRIs. The other options as far as treating the tumor are microsurgery, as you mentioned, and gamma knife radiation therapy. Um, Can surgery help with tinnitus? Yeah, sometimes it can, but sometimes it can make it worse, too. So it's really individualized, and you haven't had a scan yet, so I wouldn't get too worked up that you have an acoustic neuroma until you get that scan, but I do think you need one. Catherine can comment on hearing aid technology and some of the new technology that's out there to help patients with tinnitus like yourself. 
sure. So this is just such a great example where you need complete hearing health care, you know, and you can go down this path to a certain extent in parallel. So you need that otologist who's going to be ordering the right tests, looking and interpreting that data and figuring out uh, medically what treatment you need. And at the same time, you have hearing loss and you have tinnitus and it's getting in your way. And, you know, sometimes um, in our clinic we don't even talk about hearing. We try to just talk about communication because that's really what it's all about. And, and communication is what connects people to other people. It's what makes us want to go out and participate. And we know when, when that's compromised that we don't participate. And there are all sorts of bad outcomes when we, we stop doing that. And you're obviously a really active person. So you want to make a relationship with an audiologist you trust. Um, again, if you haven't found someone, you can go onto audiology.org and find someone, or if you already have one, that's great, because this is going to be um, a, a long process and an ongoing process to figure out what's just going to work the best for you. But what's exciting in the hearing aid technology is we have built into them now ways to generate low-level um, and in a sense, you can think of it as comforting sounds that can really help manage the experience you're having with, with tinnitus or the other sounds in your ears. Um, and as you said, you can manage that using outside sources, but if it's really happening, you know, going on all the time, it's really nice to have that be an individualized solution that's just part of you, um, and then you can kind of move on and not make that your focus. So audiologists work with technology to help with that, and then we have entire counseling programs to really help people adjust to the technology and, and understand what's going on. So I think you can be helped um, down two pathways here, and they're, they're both really important pathways for you. Hopefully that helps you out, Hal. Great question, though, and uh, I think it brought up a lot of good issues for uh, Catherine and I to talk about. Let's say hello to Sonia from Utah. Sonia, welcome to Dr. Radio. Hi. Um, my husband has officiated high school football for 33 years and has hearing loss due to blowing the whistle. Mm -hmm. um, he has worn hearing aids for about six years, but I have been looking at some of the things coming out, and he has a great audiologist, by the way, um, but I've been looking at some things coming out, and my question is, I'm seeing that they're doing prosthesis for the small bones in the inner ear and different things. Are these things that actually help those with hearing aids, or is that really for something else? What you're talking about is a middle ear problem, so if, if the... Um physician is the surgeon is going in and dealing in the in the middle ear then that's that's a medical problem that can be dealt with um it sounds like you know i, I don't know your husband I haven't seen his audiogram but you're talking about noise induced hearing loss with the whistles which is really an issue for these coaches and uh referees and things like that that's going to be a permanent sensory hearing loss so that's not treatable in the okay. same way um but if you have so your, your audiologist you're in good shape but it but Sonia, yeah, for, so for the audience out there, uh, the middle ear prosthesis are little artificial ear bones. We use them all the time, every day, uh, and they're to treat conductive hearing loss. So some people have, uh, for instance, had their ear bones eroded from an infectious process or a cholesteatoma can erode those little ear bones. We can fix that problem. For, for someone like your husband who probably, again, without seeing his autogram, we don't know, but for someone who has noise-induced sensory neural hearing loss, there are implants out there called cochlear implants, and they're really for patients who are struggling with their hearing aids. So they tell you or they tell Catherine, boy, you know, I'm just not understanding. The noises are loud, but I just can't understand. I'm not getting benefit. Those are people that I think Catherine and I would agree should really get in and get evaluated for what else is out there, potentially a cochlear implant. Get evaluated. We do a really, really kind of lousy job of getting the word out increasing awareness regarding cochlear implants and letting people know that, in fact, if you are a person that struggles with well-fit, appropriate hearing aids, then there are other things out there. Cochlear implants are amazing. I know Catherine and I both work with cochlear implant patients every day. Yeah, you know, and I think the other thing that brings up that I think can be comforting to any of your listeners and something I certainly feel good about saying to our patients is really no matter what happens, we, there is going to be a solution. You're going to keep communicating. 
um, and, and, you know, you're going to be able to do that. So I think that's important because there really is a whole continuum of solutions. The other comment I would make if your husband's still active is it is never too late to protect your hearing. And that, I think, is something people don't understand. The attitude is, ah, I've already lost my hearing. But it's incremental, and, and the way hearing moves, the, the more loss you have, the harder it is actually for us to really help um, as much as we could have when it was less. So if he's still doing that, he wants to wear hearing protection. And usually in the kind of thing he's doing, the person's concerned, of, but, but I need to hear. And that's same like our musicians. So when you talk to your audiologist next, he may want to think about something like musician earplugs where you can change the level of filter so he can still hear, but it's going to reduce enough to give him some protection. That's great. I didn't even know there was such a thing, so we will definitely bring that up. Maybe yeah. describe for the audience what a musician ear plug is, plug is sure. Uh, Catherine. Sure. So they can be non-custom or custom, and both are, are really good. Um, people who want the custom, which is then the audiologist will put silicone in your ear and make you know get the shape of your ear. We usually do that for someone maybe who has a, a very small ear or a bendy ear, and, and the non-custom don't fit them, or someone who's just using it so often it's more comfortable. But what it does is it creates a way to decrease the sound that's going into your ear um, equally by pitch. And so what that means is what you end up hearing still sounds correct, just lower. And the problem with um, non-musician earplugs, they still protect your hearing. I don't want to minimize that. So if you have people out there using like the little yellow squishy things and it's working for them, then by all means keep using them. But what they do is they take some pitches out more than others. So for people like musicians or people like coaches or refs where they're very aware that they need to hear accurately, they're going to be happier with the musician earplugs. And the non-custom, you know, depending on where you go get them, are going to run you between maybe 10 and $20. So, I mean, so worth it to not, you know, to, to not get hearing loss to protect your hearing. But, again, um, don't think just because you have some hearing loss you shouldn't protect your hearing. You absolutely should. And sports are a great example. We make custom ear ear. Um, earplugs for many, many of our sideline um, people um, on all of our big, big teams here in Pittsburgh, and we are a big sports city, so big, lousy stadium, <laughs> lousy with noise. When the 49ers beat you last week, so I won't rub that in. I won't. In fact, I'm not even going to bring it up. Yeah, but you're in New York. So why... <laughs> but I grew up in California. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to bring that up. Just so you know. I appreciate that very much. Okay. We're, we're doing the best we can. We have a few challenges. Uh, you, yeah, you sure. do. But, but so noise do isn't one of them. Who does We're there, anyway. <laughs> Who doesn't? Sonia, thanks for calling. Hopefully that was helpful. It was. Thank you very much. Awesome. I want to thank uh, Dr. Catherine Palmer for joining us. Uh, hope you had fun. We had fun. We answered a lot of great phone calls. And uh, I appreciate that you taking the time out of your day joining us.